Hello, I uh, hope you're all well. Um, thanks again to the Oxford Communist Corresponding Society for asking me to give a talk, which I'm happy to do. Uh, today we're going to be talking about Marx's transformation problem. Okay, so Aristotle, writing in the 4th century BC, described how farmers and fishermen bartered their surplus product in the marketplace and how this introduced the need for money. Now we can imagine that perhaps Aristotle or one of his slaves would have walked to the stalls in the Athenian Agora and purchased fruit for the household using some of the silver coins that he mentions in his text on the Athenian constitution. So even in antiquity then, the phenomenon of money and markets presented itself. And this immediately posed the question of the nature of economic value. Why does one fish have the same value as two loaves of bread? And Aristotle recognised that the exchange of goods implies that there's something equal about them. And he recognised that the money value of those goods measures that equality. But what is that value and what determines its magnitude? Well, Aristotle suggested that the equality of wants between the buyer and seller determined economic value. Economic value was whatever was agreed face to face at the market store. Now, much, much later in history, in the 17th and 18th centuries, a new type of society emerged which reposed the question of economic value in entirely new circumstances. In Britain, uh, during this period, large numbers of peasants were thrown off the land and into the workshops and factories in the cities. New kinds of institutions, capitalist firms, commanded hundreds of labourers to produce commodities for the market. Competition stimulated the application of machinery, which significantly increased the productivity of labour. The population of waged labourers exploded, and the British ruling class became rich from colonial conquest, the direct enslavement of millions in plantations abroad, and the exploitation of millions of workers at home. And in these circumstances, everything had a price, even people. Identical commodities were produced again and again with scientific and mechanical precision. Production could be scaled up or down according to market demand. The working population became a fungible resource that could be deployed and redeployed to different economic ends. Prices, as they did in ancient markets, still fluctuated according to supply and demand, or whether the buyer or seller struck a good deal, uh, but the enormously increased scale and regularity of commodity production presented an obvious truth. The prices of commodities were clearly related to the quantity of resources used up to produce them. So a shirt would typically command a higher price in the market compared to raw cotton because producing shirts uses up additional resources, such as the labour time of the cutters and sewers in the shirt producing factories. And so, in these completely different social circumstances, the question of economic value was posed anew, but on a much grander scale. And this led to the emergence of a new, specialised field of human knowledge, now referred to as classical political economy. Sir William Petty, born in 1623, broke with the Aristotelian tradition that mutual wants in the market determine the magnitude of value. Instead, he suggested that economic value is not really a phenomenon of market exchange, but is something produced outside the market when labour is combined with land. And so value is reducible to the money cost of that labour and that land. Petty also suggested that capital, such as machinery and raw materials, are the results of past labour, and so capital can be ultimately reduced to the price of labour too. John Locke, born in 1632, sought to eradicate land from this theoretical picture. He traced back all the inputs that directly and indirectly are used up to produce a commodity, all the way back 
to a hypothetical raw state of nature in the past where humans first confronted the uncultivated land without any tools or machinery. Locke argued that from this point of view, labour must account for 99% or more of the value of commodities. Francis Hutchinson, born in 1694, and Adam Smith's uh, teacher, his professor, he suggested that the sacrifices of labour, that, that is the, the difficulty of production of commodities, determines economic value. David Hume, born in 1711, and Adam Smith's best friend, argued that nature is a free gift, that commodities are mere storehouses for labour, and that labour is the active agent that produces all commodities. So Hume took a step towards reducing all real material costs of production to labour, labour costs. Adam Smith, born in 1723, proposed that labour is indeed the source of value, the true wealth of nations, and that the sacrifices made by labour is the true measure of economic value. And Smith proposed that, in a supposed early and rude state of society before the emergence of capitalism, commodities would in fact exchange according to the labour sacrifices needed to bring them to market. But Smith said now, uh, in modern society of his time, workers don't get the whole fruits of their labour because some of the surplus produce is distributed to landowners and capitalists. And so the value of a commodity is determined by the cost of the labour the rent of the land and the profit of the capitalists that's all necessary to bring it to market. And so in the space of about 100 years, the leading thinkers of the emerging bourgeois order began to view economic value as being determined by objective laws of production, competition and distribution, rather than by the ex accidental and subjective coincidence of wants in a small marketplace nestled between the hills of Athens. Let's now turn to David Ricardo, born in 1772, who proposed an especially clear version of the classical labour theory of value. Ricardo wasn't content with Smith's cost of production theory for a simple reason. In Smith's theory, if wages change, then the value of commodities change too. But the wage is simply the price for another commodity which happens to be labour. And so Smith really only gives us a price theory of price. And that seems circular, and that seems to be an unsatisfying explanation of economic value. Ricardo proposed instead that the natural prices of reproducible commodities are regulated by their difficulty of production, to use his term, which he proposed that we should measure in terms of labour time, the labour resources used up to make things. Now, natural prices are not market prices, they are special kinds of prices. Market prices fluctuate according to supply and demand. This will generate temporary profits and losses. Capitalists who seek to maximise their profits will reallocate their capital to high profit sectors and away from low profit sectors of the economy. And so this scramble for profit has the side effect of reducing mismatches between supply and demand. And that causes market prices, according to Ricardo and Smith, to gravitate towards their natural prices, which are the prices that would empirically manifest when supply and demand are equal everywhere. So the natural price of commodities according to Ricardo's theory should be determined by their objective difficulty of production because any fluctuations due to commodities, commodities being over or under supplied have gone, have disappeared in this natural price situation. So in Ricardo's theory market prices vary due to supply and demand but behind these temporary and somewhat accidental fluctuations stands real not monetary costs of production, the real objective material difficulty of making things which we can choose to measure in units of labour resources. So from now on, let's use the term labour value uh, to refer 
to the total direct and indirect labour time that's used up to produce a commodity, given the prevailing techniques of production that are in play. Now, if this theory is right, then we'd expect natural prices of commodities to perfectly reflect their corresponding labour values, and in fact be in a one-to-one -one proportional relationship to each other. Said in a different way, if the quantity of labour time required to make a commodity increases, then we'd expect its natural price to increase proportionally. And in fact, in some special cases, labour values do vary one-to-one -one with natural prices. One special case is Adam Smith's early and rude state, without landlords and capitalists, where rental income and profits are absent. But as Smith and Ricardo understood, prices aren't completely reducible to wages, precisely because prices include components, cost components, that can consist of rent and profit. Let's put rent out of the picture, because this will help us focus on the essential issues. In capitalist conditions, and this is a crucial point, the structure of natural prices will change with different profit rates, even when labour values don't. And Ricardo understood very clearly that this was a theoretical problem, because even when we exclude the effect of supply and demand, we still have prices changing even when the difficulty of production of making things hasn't altered at all. And Ricardo realised that natural prices depend on the distribution of income, that is, how much capitalists get in the form of profit and how much workers get in the form of wages. But labour values are a purely technical measure of direct and indirect labour costs. So natural prices, as a purely logical matter, have an additional degree of freedom unrelated to labour values. They can vary independently of labour values. And so Ricardo's theory couldn't fully explain prices. And so Ricardo's search for other measures of real cost, other measures of difficulty of production that might not suffer from this problem. He considered quantities of money, quantities of corn, or even quantities of a kind of average commodity that would minimise the mismatch between natural prices and labour values. He thought this problem was so important, he worked on it in the last few weeks of his life, but try as he might, he couldn't define a measure of economic value that could explain the structure of natural prices. And this theoretical problem ultimately led to the abandonment of Ricardo's theory of value. So let's now turn to Marx, who was born in 1818. He was deeply influenced by classical political economy, but he also revolutionised that theory. Ricardo had just wanted to find a standard of economic value, something objective outside of the market that would explain or measure prices. Marx, in contrast, claimed that quantities of money and therefore prices in fact represent labour time quite independently of our theoretical choice of how we want to measure value. According to Marx, the dynamics of capitalist competition connect flows of money and changes in the division of labour. So prices ultimately represent labour time not because we say so, or we think that it should, but in virtue of objective economic laws that bind the social representation of value, such as money, to its objective content, which is labour time. In other words, our own social activity, quite independently of what we may think, instantiates causal laws that relate the economic unit of account, such as pounds or dollars or euros, to labour times. But even though Marx's theory had many profound differences to Ricardo's theory, nonetheless Ricardo's problem reappeared in Marx's theory. So let's examine what form the problem took in Marx's theory. So, briefly, Marx defined the labour value of a commodity as composed of two elements. First, the labour value of the constant capital that gets used up to produce it, where constant capital 
is a catch-all term for any inputs to production, including machinery and tools, raw materials and so on. Think of this as labour that's indirectly supplied in other parts of the economy that's needed to produce a particular commodity. The second element of labour value is the labour directly supplied to produce the commodity. Think of this as the actual work that transforms inputs, which have been supplied from other sectors, to produce the final commodity for sale in the market. So, during the production of a particular commodity, workers add their own labour to the output and transfer the labour value of the constant capital to the output. So the labour value of a commodity is the sum of the direct plus the indirect labour that was used up to produce it. And therefore the labour value of a commodity measures the total labour time given the prevailing techniques of production that's currently supplied uh, to make it. Now we have to point out here, as Marx did, that the labour value isn't simply the sum of concrete labour times or simple clock times. If workers decide to slack off and take double the amount of time than what's typical, they don't therefore add double the labour value to their output. Marx points out that not all concrete labour time actually counts, that not, not all concrete labour time is socially necessary. But to focus on the essentials, let's assume that all firms that produce the same commodity use exactly the same techniques. And let's also assume that workers producing the same commodity take the same amount of time to do it, always. Given these assumptions, then Marx's labour values are a simple function or property of the prevailing techniques of production. Marx uses the phrase conditions of production. OK, that's Marx's labour values. Now, in volume one, Marx explicitly assumes prices are proportional to labour values. And on this basis, he elaborates his theory of surplus value, which explains that profit is the money representation of the unpaid or surplus labour of the working class. But Marx needs to establish the generality of this proposition in the case of natural prices, which aren't proportional to labour values. And so he tackles this in his unfinished notes that were published as volume three of Capital. Both Marx and Engels understood the crucial importance of resolving Ricardo's theoretical difficulties. Solving this problem, which had so befuddled the bourgeois theorists, would be a win for the theoretical superiority of the new science of the socialist movement. But also this problem had to be resolved because the proletariat needed to be armed with the correct and true theory of the contradictory dynamics of capitalist society. And in fact, Engels, in his introduction to the second volume of Capital, boasted in advance that Marx had solved this famous problem. Engels challenged other economists to propose their solution before the big reveal when volume three was to be published. So he gave them a chance to anticipate Marx's um, solution. So, volume three. Marx analyzes an economic situation where we suppose market prices have completely gravitated towards stable natural prices, which Marx calls prices of production. So remember, in this situation, supply equals demand everywhere. And let's also assume, as Marx does, that no firm or sector enjoys monopoly profits. And in consequence, the profit rates in all the different sectors of the economy are uniform. Capitalists lack any incentive to reallocate their money capital to search for higher returns. And so this natural price situation can reproduce itself through time with constant natural prices and a fixed allocation of the labour force to the different productive sectors of the economy. Before continuing, we need to be clear about the empirical status of this situation. Some people think that because the situation is a type of equilibrium state, but capitalism is never in equilibrium, but forever turbulent and changing, then this natural price situation is irrelevant to reality and we can ignore it. Profit rates, either within a nation state or across the globe, they're never uniform, prices are never stable and so on. And therefore Marx was wasting his time even thinking about these special circumstances. But Marx knew this special state was important to analyse for the simple reason that it's real. Not real in the sense of actually empirically manifesting at any moment of time, 
but real in the sense that it's an attractor for the dynamics of capitalist competition. In other words, at all times, the economy is being continually pushed towards this state by the law of value, by the dynamics of capitalist competition. And so the effects of this attractor situation, the state, are always real. So analogously, just because birds fly doesn't mean that the law of gravity is false or that the birds don't experience a force of attraction towards the earth. But of course, there are always many other mechanisms at play in economic reality, not just the law of value. Innovation will alter the conditions of production. External shocks can disrupt production. The state can intervene in the economy in various ways, and on and on and on. And therefore the actual trajectory of capitalist economies, although always permanently and partially controlled by the law of value, the actual trajectory never reaches the natural price equilibrium. Nonetheless, this state, this equilibrium state, is an attractor for price dynamics and continually exerts a real influence. So we should interpret Marx in Volume 3 as performing a counterfactual exercise to, real, to reveal the hidden mechanism of the law of value, to reveal what direction the law of value is pushing the economy at all times. Now I've taken a slight detour to explain this point because it's a tendency to reject Marx's equilibrium methodology, but it's simply not possible to explain disequilibrium trajectories without understanding what equilibrium attractors are in play. Okay, so when natural prices obtain, then the truth of a labour theory of value should become particularly transparent and clear and obvious. Because here supply equals demand and there are no scarcity prices. We therefore expect that in these circumstances planes would cost more than pens because planes require more of society's labour time to produce. So it's here in the special state that the one-to-one -one lawful correspondence between prices and labour values should manifest itself. But it doesn't. We don't see a one-to-one -one correspondence. The structure of prices is different from the structure of labour values. There's still a mismatch even when all the deviations due to supply and demand have melted away. Marx completely accepts that there must be a mismatch, and he also understands why there is one. So let's um, illustrate this point. Let's say the uniform profit rate is 2%. The price of each commodity, therefore, is a 2% markup on top of the money cost of producing it. And the money cost of producing the commodity is the sum of the cost of the constant capital plus the wages of the direct labour employed to make it. So natural prices are proportional to the total money cost of producing each commodity, where the constant of proportionality is the profit rate. But the labour value of each commodity is independent of that profit rate. Labour values depend on the conditions of production. They don't depend on money prices or capitalist profit rates at all. In fact, Marx intends that labour values ultimately explain profits because profits are unpaid labour time. So on the one hand, natural prices vary with the profit rate. So if it changes from 2% to 3%, then the whole price structure will change. And these new prices, these new natural prices, aren't proportional to the old ones. It's not a proportional change because in an interconnected economy where the outputs of one sector are also the inputs of another and therefore the price of a commodity is reducible to the prices of other input commodities and input wages, then a change in the uniform profit rate across all sectors has a non-proportional and complicated effect. So a change in the uniform profit rate level has scrambles the prices into it in a new different directions. You get new natural prices. But labour values don't change. They stay the same. And so, in general, the price of commodities, even in this special situation, are not in a one-to-one -one correspondence with labour values, and they can vary independently of labour values. So again, the form of value, that is exchange value in the market, seems to be radically disconnected from the content of value, which is supposedly the labour time supplied in production. And this mismatch 
is the reason why Smith restricted the labour theory to pre-capitalist societies and why Ricardo failed to resolve his theoretical difficulties. So how did Marx propose to solve this mismatch? Marx's big idea was to separate the origin of value, that is the creation of new value, from the distribution of that value to the different classes in society. Marx maintained that human labour and human labour alone creates new economic value in production. But this new value, in circumstances of a capitalist economy, is appropriated by capitalists in a manner that obscures its origin. According to Marx, money profits represent the surplus value supplied by workers, which is the difference between the labour time they supply and the labour value of the goods and services that they purchase with their wages. So workers supply this surplus value in production, which eventually ends up arriving in the form of luxury goods for capitalist households or investment goods to grow the capital stock of the economy. Now, the surplus value supplied by workers in different industries depends on how much direct labour is employed because the source of surplus value is, is living labour, not machinery or raw inputs. The new surplus value that's created in production doesn't depend on the quantity of constant capital that's um, employed in production in a particular sector. <clears throat> so Marx in volume 3, considers a situation where initially money profits are non-uniform across the sectors and are proportional to the direct labour employed in each industry because that's where the surplus value and the profit originally comes from. And so in this situation, labour-intensive industries yield more profit than capital-intensive industries because labour-intensive production yields more surplus value because more workers are employed uh, directly in the production of that commodity. And so profits are clearly and transparently just surplus value. And it also turns out that in this situation that Marx proposes, natural prices and labour values are in a one-to-one -one correspondence. So everything starts working out nicely. The beginning, the labour theory value is transparently the case. But Marx knew that in this situation of non-uniform profits, then capitalists have an incentive to reallocate their capital away from low profit and towards high profit industries. So Marx um, describes that when the scramble for profits kicks in, the economy gravitates from this initial situation of prices proportional to labour values to a final situation where uniform profits prevail. So the relatively high profits in industries that are labour intensive and the relatively low profits in industries that are capital intensive are evened out and become uniform. And therefore, in this final situation, we're back to the natural price equilibrium and there's no longer a one-to-one -one relationship with labour values. So Marx has given us a before and an after before we had non-uniform profit rates and a one-to-one -one relationship between prices and labour values. Afterwards, we have uniform profit rates and the absence of a one-to-one -one relationship. But Marx says that the process of profit rate equalisation is identically a process by which individual capitals grab a share of the surplus value produced from all industries according to the distributional rule equal amounts of money capital invested earn an equal return, regardless of whether that investment occurs in capital or labour intensive industries. And this is Marx's theory of the transformation. Surplus value is produced unequally in different sectors, according to how much labour is directly employed in those sectors, but by the magic of profit rate equalisation, all capitalists, in whatever sector they invest, receive equal shares of that surplus value, proportional to the size of their investments. 
And because this transformation occurs purely in the realm of exchange value, because the transformation is purely a matter of changes in the price structure of the economy, and not due to any changes in the conditions of production, then this transformation must be conservative. No new surplus value is created or destroyed. Labour values don't change. So the original quantity of surplus value is merely redistributed. And so Marx says that although natural prices don't appear to be related one to one to labour values, in fact, they still are. Marx's point is that, yes, prices diverge from labour values because capitalists grab their share of the total labour time supplied by workers proportional to their investments. But that share ultimately is just redistributed surplus value. The true underlying cause, the origin of profits in human labour, is hidden and scrambled by the economic rules of capitalism. And so Marx therefore claims something important. He claims that we can recover the one-to-one -one relationship by considering the prices of larger aggregates of commodities rather than individual commodity types. And because the transformation is conservative, he says that three aggregate equalities need to hold between the price system and labour values. He says that the profit rate is determined by dividing the total surplus value produced by the sum of the labour value of all the constant capital and all the wage goods. So the money profit rate is, despite appearances, ultimately determined in production and by how much workers are exploited. And he says that the total sum of profit income received by capitalists as a whole is proportional to the total surplus value. And finally, that the total price of all commodities sold is proportional to their total labour value. So we have three aggregate conservation constraints that should hold. So the transformation scrambles the one-to-one -one relationship between prices and labour values, but it's a conservative transformation, and so the one-to-one -one relationship reappears when we consider larger aggregates. And in Volume 3, Marx gives us a fully worked out numerical example that demonstrates precisely this. So it looks like Marx has solved the main problem that so befuddled Smith and Ricardo. Marx's transformation theory reasserts the core claim of a labour theory of value, which is that human labour is the source of value and that monetary magnitudes represent labour time. Now, Marx's answer is a very good answer, and in general terms, it captures an important truth about the nature of capitalist production and distribution. But, and here we come to the great controversy, which started as soon as Volume 3 was published. Marx leaves us with a small, loose thread that, when pulled, seems to unravel the whole theory. In fact, these issues have become so controversial, even claiming there is a transformation problem has itself become controversial. So, what is the problem? The problem, quite simply, is that Marx's transformation cannot be a conservative one. The one-to-one -one relationship between prices and labour values is actually lost during the transformation. And the reason why is actually very simple. Labour values are a property of the conditions of production, about the actual human cost of making things. But the profit rate, and therefore the structure of natural prices, is a property of the class struggle, about the economic conflict between workers and capitalists, which determines the level of wages and the profit rate, which determines how the net product is divided between the classes, how much stuff each class gets. Prices must fluctuate according to a distributional conflict, but labour values don't. And this means that the prices of even large aggregates of commodities vary independently of large aggregates of labour values. And so the disconnect between prices and labour values simply reappears just on a larger scale. 
Marx's numerical example seems to satisfy his conservation claims only because Marx doesn't properly formulate the natural prices in his example. And Marx, who was no fool, was the first to notice this. After giving his successful numerical example, he immediately points out that he assumed that the prices of input goods were proportional to their labour value. But when an economy is reproducing itself over time with natural prices, this assumption is false. The prices of input goods are also natural prices and therefore not proportional to labour values. Marx, in a way, mixed up his before and after situations. And so Marx writes, begin, quote, there is always the possibility of an error, end quote, if this assumption is made. And Marx, in volume three, which is his unfinished notes, doesn't pursue this further. Instead, he remarks, begin, quote, our present analysis does not necess necessitate a closer examination of this point, end quote. And that's what Marx left us with. A brilliant theoretical solution to a long-standing problem of classical political economy, but with one small loose thread. And of course, all the critics pulled that thread. Very soon after Marx's solution was published, it was attacked. And the attacks haven't stopped. In the intervening 150 years or so, the core logical problem that Marx's theory of the transformation, that it cannot be conservative, that core problem has been demonstrated again and again in lots of different ways, both informally and formally. So Marx's transformation theory has become to be known as Marx's transformation problem. Many people, especially Marxists, have denied the problem exists, also in many different ways. The transformation problem is incredibly controversial and remains so to this day. It's generated decades and decades of controversy. It's generated volumes and volumes of literature, both pro and against. And it's birthed multitudes of new interpretations of Marx's text that attempt to wriggle out of the logical contradiction. Yet, despite the lack of consensus, it remains an incredibly important scientific problem because it's essentially concerned with what these numbers that we hold in our pockets, that we throw entire around the entire world, what they actually mean, what they actually represent. Marx's transformation problem is intimately connected to what money really is, about the meaning of this social symbol that dominates our lives. And it's utterly bound up with the very same fundamental question that was first posed, but not answered, when we started exchanging some of our surplus produce in small marketplaces using coins. So we've come to the end of the beginning of the transformation problem. Perhaps in subsequent talks, we'll get the opportunity to discuss the subsequent history of different reactions to it, or even finally get to the end of it.